Welcome to Camrio Healing Rooms, to those who are in person and those who are online. Tonight's teaching is entitled, Your Salvation Ticket Includes Healing. This title came from five different events that have happened in my life in the first week of April. And as I meditated on these events, along with the scripture that they were pointing to, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel message, what Jesus did for us on the cross, I heard God speaking to me so clearly. And I, I believe that as I share tonight, that people just hearing this message will be set free from the captivity of bondages to sicknesses, diseases, and other types of bondages. So let us pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that you are the God, the King of all kings, the one who reigns eternally. And Father, I thank you tonight for opening up ears and hearts to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, to hear the gospel of our salvation. And Father, we thank you that as the word goes forth for the accompanying power of your Holy Spirit for healings and signs and wonders and miracles to happen in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to share five snapshots of these events that took place in the first week of April. The first snapshot I call a case for heaven tickets. So in advance, online, my husband buys tickets for this documentary called A Case for Heaven. How many of you guys saw that? It was in our theaters in the first week of April. It was only here for three days. My husband bought those tickets in advance online. But that morning, I felt this urge in my spirit to invite a girlfriend to come along with us. The problem was neither her nor I knew how to make tickets online that would be next to us. So to make a long story short, my husband went ahead and he bought not one ticket, but two tickets. And so I had an extra ticket now. And I said to him, what do I do with this extra ticket? And he goes, go invite somebody else. Logical, right? So I invited three other people. I gave them an invitation. I said to them, hey, I got an extra movie ticket. Would you like to come with us tonight? Well, that was in the afternoon, only a few hours before, you know, maybe five, six hours before the movie began, and they all made excuses. They said, no, <laughs> they had already made their plans, and they seemed reasonable, but in the light of what just happened that morning, the next snapshot of event that I'm going to share with you, as well as all the other snapshots of events that took place that week, it made me wonder, when God gives us an invitation to heaven, because that's what a case for heaven was about, Lee Strobel was saying, hey, heaven and hell are real, and you have a choice whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. Whether you receive Jesus' invitation or not. And then he went ahead and he gave validity to his movie by going ahead and sharing people who had near-death experiences. But not everyone accepts, just like these people that I invited didn't accept the invitation. There's a lot of people who are not accepting God's invitation. So, these people that I had invited, it seemed reasonable. Their excuses seemed reasonable. But when God gives us an invitation to heaven, to go what people think of as the afterlife, we're given a choice. But daily, God is giving us an invitation to experience heaven on earth. And are our plans too important to accept God's invitation of his will being done in us and through us. So that goes to snapshot now, number two, which I entitled the Wedding Feast Parable Invitation. So just that morning I'm reading, I, it was our scheduled reading for the day, Matthew 22, 
the wedding feast parable. And in the wedding feast parable, Jesus himself likens this extravagant wedding feast to heaven. And in this wedding feast parable, which many of you are familiar with, there's a king, and he's putting on a wedding banquet, an extraordinary one for his son. And he has already invited people, but he tells his servants, he says, tell them that now is the time for the wedding to begin. Go tell them to come on in to the banqueting table. Many of them, we are told, made excuses of why they could not come. All those excuses seem reasonable and understandable from a human or from their own natural limited perspective. And some people even went ahead and mistreated and killed the servants that gave the invitation. And we know that's happening worldwide today. So when God heard that these people who were invited weren't coming, he says, I want my son to have one of the best weddings ever. And he says, so go, go out into the streets. He says, invite those who are poor and lame and maimed and blind. Invite them to come in to the wedding banquet, which he likened to heaven. And then these people came, and he says, Oh, my house isn't full yet. Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel the people to come in. So they did that, and the people came. And I'm just going to insert in there, one man who came didn't put on the robe that he was given, the attire, everyone who came to the wedding banquet were given a special robe, but one decided not to put it on, and he was thrown out into utter darkness. So just keep that in mind as we go. In Luke 14, the parallel account of Matthew 22, the extravagant wedding feast is known as the Great Supper. That reminds us of the Lord's Supper. So this goes to snapshot number three, where the night before in the Camryo Healing Rooms on Tuesday night, April the 5th, Lynn Grosby was teaching. And her teaching was an invitation to dine with the king. And in that, she was like one of the servants compelling people to come to commune with the king king, to have communion with him, and to talk with him. And in one of her concluding statements, she says this, each time we celebrate communion, we have a preview taste of the wedding banquet of the lamb, that's the lamb of God, and his bride, when we see Jesus face to face and dine with him in eternity. You and I are able to experience the present tense reality of heaven. How at the communion table, when we commune with him, when we, we partake of his word, and we partake of communion, and we can commune with him, he's inviting us throughout the day. He's sending forth invitations to us. And he says... Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I'll come in and I will dine with him. Just like I gave those movie invitations. At the last minute, they said no because they had already made their plans. Are we so planned out that we cannot hear God's voice and cannot go ahead and dine with him doing his will here on this earth? Lynn, at her end of her teaching, she asked the people, she says, how will you respond to God's invitation. How many have really wanted to go somewhere? For Wes, it would be the Dodger game, you know. And you know all your friends have got a free ticket and you can't go, and you got the, you know, they're getting the invitations, but you didn't get one. 
Well, God wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have been given an invitation to dine with the king so that you cannot just experience heaven one day in the afterlife, but that you can experience heaven here on this earth. Snapshot number four, I entitled, Your Ticket, Your Ticket to Heaven Track. So here I am, I'm handing out Two days prior to Tuesday, on that Sunday, April 3rd, I'm handing out flyers for Lynn's class, an invitation to dine with a king, when a man in our church gives me your ticket to heaven, admit one track. This man goes out on the street, and he says about two to three days a week, he compels the people to go ahead and invite Jesus Christ into their heart, so that they can experience heaven, eternal life. And this track begins like this. May I offer you a ticket to heaven? You don't have to pay for it. And that's a good thing because you could never afford to buy it. It's free, but only because someone has already paid the ultimate price for it. The phrase ticket to heaven merely puts God's salvation in terms that people can understand. God offers each person a ticket to heaven that has been paid for in full through Jesus Christ's sacrificial work of the cross. But as we heard in Matthew 22, there's going to be people that reject God's ticket to heaven. We need to compel them to come in. But there's people who have accepted God's invitation, his ticket to heaven, his salvation ticket, yet they do not know what the ticket actually includes. To help illustrate this point that I just said, that people don't know what this ticket includes, I'm going to tell you a story that I actually heard years ago from a preacher in another church. And I call it the cheese and crackers story. So this is the best that I remember it. So there was a family, a father and his wife and kids, and they wanted to go to America. So the father had to work very, very hard to get the money for the tickets, and also he had to work very, very hard to get food for the journey. It was going to take a little over three weeks at that point in time. So he gets the, money, the, the tickets, and he gets his food, his family. They board the ship, and they're on the ship. And every time it comes to mealtime, they're in their room, and they're eating their cheese and crackers. And they are so happy. They're going to America. America! They're going. And all the while, they're hearing these people laugh and happiness as people go by their door down the hallway to the banqueting room. And they're going, we wish we could go, but we know one day we are going to America. The third week comes, and the captain of the ship says this. He says, tomorrow we are going to land in America. The father was so delighted, so beside himself. He says, I'm going to go to the captain and ask him how much it costs to purchase tickets to go to the banqueting room. I want to celebrate with my family. So he goes to the captain of the ship. Captain, I was just wondering how much it would cost for a meal because my family and I want to celebrate going to America being in America tomorrow. And the captain looks at him and goes, what do you mean? He was all puzzled. What do you mean? And the man says, what do, you, what do I mean? I mean, I want to purchase a ticket for me and my family. There's my wife and my three kids. I want to purchase a ticket for each one of us. And the captain says, you mean you didn't know that all the meals every day were provided in your ticket to America? The father's lack of knowledge kept not only himself, but his entire 
family from coming to the banqueting table every day for every meal of their voyage. Discover all your salvation ticket includes. Your ticket to heaven is an all-inclusive, paid-in-full ticket. It will not only provide you entrance into heaven someday after you die, but it will allow you provide for all your needs here on this earth and allow you to experience literally heaven on earth. There are so many verses in the Bible that point to this. So many from Old to New Testament. I'm going to share two only. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all freely, how shall he not with him give us all, all things? All things? All things, including being healed of sicknesses and diseases? Yes. Salvation includes healing. Luke 15, 31. The elder son, he looks at the younger son in the prodigal son story, Luke 15, and he says, oh, Why is the younger son getting everything? He got the full wardrobe. He got that robe of righteousness and the ring of authority and the sandals of sonship. And he had a banquet. Father, you put on a banqueting table for him, a giant banquet and celebrated. And the father says to the elder son, Luke 15, 31, all I have is yours. You see, Jesus, he is your salvation ticket. In the Hebrew language, his name shows up in the Old Testament as Yeshua. And when we were studying the Psalms, Yeshua appeared throughout the Psalms. It means the Lord is salvation. So remember that name, Yeshua. Jesus, our Savior, came to what? Save us. The Greek word for save is sozo. Both Yeshua, Jesus in Hebrew, and sozo in Greek are so packed with meaning. There was not one word in the English language that could convey the fullness of what they meant. So when they're translated, you will see them translated as salvation, eternal salvation. We're going to heaven someday. But also translated as healing, deliverance, wholeness, victory, help, and so, so much more. Because our salvation includes everything. Yeshua, Jesus, in the Old Testament, had seven redemptive Names, Redemptive names point to Jesus where one day he would go to Calvary and redeem us out of the hand of the enemy. When you look up this word redemption or to redeem, it is so fantastic. It means this, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage. Now get this. Or from any obligation to suffer by paying an equivalent penalty. When it comes to sickness and disease, so many people think, I didn't do everything right, therefore I need to pay for my mistakes. Jesus went to the cross to pay for all my mistakes. One of Jesus' redemptive names is Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. Jehovah Rapha. Jesus, Yeshua, has given us his royal wardrobe to wear. I love Isaiah 61.10 that talks about our salvation. It says this, that he has given us the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. 
before you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, you, through your natural birth, were made a sinner. Okay? That's what this is representing, the black, a sinner. The, but the moment you invited Jesus Christ into your heart, you became a new creation. Your very nature, your core identity was changed from a sinner to a saint. Well, what happened? Jesus took and bore your sin and all of its evil consequences on the cross for you. He took off his robe of righteousness and gave you his robe to put on. His sinless, spotless robe. And you get to wear this every second, every moment of your life. Every second, every moment. You make a mistake? Forgive me. I thank you for this robe of righteousness. Just because you sin, it doesn't make you a sinner. You have the robe of righteousness. So important if you want to receive healing. Like I said in the Matthew 22 parable, one of the people, everyone was given the robe. And it's the only way you get to enter in to the kingdom of heaven is with this robe. Only way you get to enter in. But one of the people in Matthew 22 wasn't wearing the robe. They got kicked out because they refused to wear it. Now, Isaiah 61, garments of salvation refer to that there's salvation has many, 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 many aspects, just like the name Yeshua and Sozo do. You are clothed with Christ. You are clothed with Jesus Christ. You have his royal wardrobe. I believe there right now, it says, as he is, so are you in this world. I believe that he is clothed with healing. There's not sickness and disease in Jesus' resurrected body. As he is, so are you. The present tense reality of heaven. Point number two. This is Roman, number, Roman numeral 2C. Jesus preached the present tense reality of heaven, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And King Jesus brought the reality of his kingdom wherever he went. And then he tells us, he gives us an invitation in Matthew 10, 7 through 8, to do the same as he did. He says, go preach, telling them that the kingdom of God is at hand. And heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus, he went about healing all. All, all who are oppressed by the devil. Doing good, healing all who are oppressed by the devil. Why? How? We can't leave this little phrase out because God was with him. So when you think, I can't do what Jesus did. I can't accept this invitation he's given me in Matthew 10, 7 through 8. To preach the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand and to demonstrate it by healing the sick, cleansing the leper. And Jesus says, yes, you can. <laughs> he says, God is with you. In Colossians 2, 9 through 10, it affirms that God is not only with us, but he is in us. The fullness of the Godhead dwelling in, bodily, in Jesus in bodily form is in you. You're complete in him. The phrase, when you see the phrase, I don't know if you guys ever saw this, but the phrase kingdom of heaven and then the kingdom of God. Well, kingdom of heaven appears 30 times in Matthew and the kingdom of God appears 70 times in the New Testament. And they're basically one in the same. Jesus desired his kingdom 
the kingdom of heaven to be spread throughout the entire world. That was Adam and Eve's commission, wasn't it? To spread what was happening in the Garden of Eden, which was heaven on earth, and take that out into the world, having dominion over. And that's our assignment also. So Jesus wants his kingdom to spread. So he teaches us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray that, but we don't often think of its reality. Heaven is where God's will is being done, where his kingdom, his kingdom of love is ruling and reigning. When someone gets healed by Jesus and demons are cast out and people are being raised from the dead, his kingdom has shown up on the scene. God wants you to know that you not only pray this, but he wants you to know to have the mindset of where you're truly at, to walk by the Spirit. So truly, you are one that this represents heaven here, that you are seated in the heavenly places inside of Christ Jesus. And where is Christ seated? He is seated far above. This is in Ephesians 121, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only this age, but the age to come. That's where you're seated, far above the name of every sickness and every disease that would ever come upon you. And then God, he exhorts us in Colossians 3, 2. He says, set your mind on this reality on the things above. And yesterday when I looked it up in the Passion Translation, it actually said this, yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. When you believe where you are and what Christ has done for you on the cross. It's not about faking it until you make it. It's living in the superior reality of what Jesus Christ has already done for you. If you think, what is the core reality of heaven? I thought that because I had this whole week of events. John 17, 3 really is clear. It's the core reality of what heaven is about. It says this, and this is eternal life, that you may know God, the only true God, and Jesus, whom he has sent. Now, I want to explain some of the Greek definitions of this word. We've heard know before, gnosko. Gnosko is knowing in an intimate way, experiencing an intimacy with the Lord experiencing who he is as a husband would know his wife. Eternal life is knowing him. So I actually looked up the word eternal yesterday in the Greek, and it's, I, I, I'm going to try to say this, ionios, okay? And according to Strong's Concordance, listen to this. It focuses not on the future per se. What? When we hear eternal life, what do you think of? Someday going to heaven? Okay, this is eternal life. But rather on the experience, but rather on experiencing the quality of God's life now as a present possession. <laughs> is that tremendous? Life, and the word life, we've comes from the Greek word zoe, which you've heard of before, which is the life of God, which gives us the ability to think like God, talk like God, act like God, walk like God, do what God did and get the results like God. So eternal life <laughs> is knowing God made in his image and likeness to do what he's called us to do. How can you know and experience eternal life, the present tense reality of what heaven is like. Through communion.
through communing with God, using his holy word as our point of conversation and using this as the truth that is superior to anything we see in the natural realm. And then partaking of his body of blood. You have often heard, you are what you eat. God wants you to eat of him. This is how you become like him. And he wants you to commune with him throughout the day. This is eternal life that you may know God. If you want to know God, he has provided a way for us to know him. Hosea 4, 6 says this, my people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowing God, knowing who he is. Before I started the healing rooms, my life and my health were being destroyed because I lacked knowledge of God. I didn't know that one of his names was Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer, my great physician. I didn't know what the scripture said about who Jesus is and what he had provided for my salvation. I didn't know that through the work of the cross that healing was provided for me. So when people prayed for me, I was hearing things that were so contrary to what I now know is the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is why I am sharing what I'm sharing tonight. And those four events prompted me to do so also. I didn't know what this ticket to heaven included. So snapshot five, I call it the healing is concealed dream. It takes place on April 8th during that first week of April. Um, what I'm going to do here, it's a healing concealed dream. And I'm putting this to represent in what is in the dream Palm trees, okay? So, this is my girlfriend's dream. I go to her house, and I didn't even share anything about my week with her. And she says, do you remember that dream that I had of you years ago? Because it was something really prominent in her mind. And I'm kind of like, hmm, you know, what is she going to tell me, you know? So she tells me this dream, and for the first time, light bulb came on for me. She says, in the dream, it was like a cafeteria-like setting. And she says, Ken, your husband, you know, your son Eric, and you were wanting to eat. You were hungry, Sue. And she says, you couldn't find the way. You couldn't find the way to the entry of the cafeteria. She says, there was palm tree branches blocking the door. She says, but when you moved, and take, I'll take a moment, when you moved the palm tree branches out of the way, you saw a brazen serpent, a serpent held up on a pole. And she says, and then you were able to see that there was a door, and you walked through the door, and when you got in, you saw there was all this cafeteria food available for you to eat. But you thought, I can't eat anything in here. Who do you think was telling me that? And she goes, the point of the story, the dream, was that you needed to sit down and start eating God's word on healing. Well, I didn't even know it was in there, did I? <laughs> that was a point before I started the healing rooms when I was really sick. So, I looked up the scripture about the bronze serpent. It occurs in Numbers 21 and in John 3. I meditated. What did her dream mean? What is this bronze serpent all about? The bronze serpent is one of the clearest types given the Old Testament of God's saving work on the cross. The Israelites had sinned against God and against Moses. So fiery serpents were causing many of them to die. And the Israelites, they cried out for God's mercy. And they asked Moses to pray for them. Moses prayed. 
And when Moses prayed, God gave him the salvation plan. And so Moses went ahead and followed God's instructions. And it says this in um, Numbers 21, 9. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. No logical reasoning could have them conclude that looking at a bronze serpent held up on a pole would bring about any good thing. But this was the means that God was using for their salvation. And Jesus, when he's speaking to the Israelites in the, um, when he was here on earth, he refers to this redemptive symbol of the brazen serpent held up on the pole. And he says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3.15. We're so familiar with the next verse, John 3.16, where he repeats that phrase again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, looks at him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. To look at him in faith of what he has done for us. So what was the Lord saying to me? If those people under the old covenant, when they looked at the means of their salvation and were restored to spiritual and physical health, perfect health they were restored to. They lived. They didn't die. They restored to perfect health. If they received that under the old covenant, how much more for you and I who are under the new covenant receive spiritual wholeness and healing and salvation as well as physical healing. The means of our salvation is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. So this dream was like, oh man, God doesn't want us to perish eternally after this life, but God doesn't want us to perish in hell here on this earth. And really sicknesses and diseases are living hell on the earth. And he has provided the means for our salvation, for our healing, amen? I mean, this is just so tremendous. Uh, Hebrews 2.3 says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You fill in the blank. How are you going to escape whatever sickness or disease you are facing or anything else in your life if you neglect the truth of the fullness of your salvation in Jesus Christ? Paying attention, looking, keeping this in the forefront of your mind. Your symptoms may be crying out, no, this is not true. And you take your sword and let that rhema of word come out of your mouth. No, Jesus, he redeemed me from the curse of the law of sin and death so that I could receive the blessing that's available to me, the blessing of divine health that's in Christ Jesus. In Bought with the Blood, The Divine Exchange of the Cross by Derek Prince. Highly recommend that book. But I've condensed it. It's on our website, www.cameriohealing.com, under resources slash prayer. And you'll find a condensed version of his book called Receive All the Benefits Jesus Provided. And when you come to the communion table, we always have that sheet out for people when they commune with God to know the fullness of their salvation. Your salvation ticket includes healing. This is Roman numeral three. In our very last session in this series of activating the power of God's word, I had entitled that message, Release God's Power for Healing. And I ended emphasizing, if you go away with one Bible verse, go away with this, in your mouth and in your heart. 1 Peter 2.24 By Jesus' stripes, 
you were healed. You know where that passage comes from? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. That Isaiah 53, if you open up your Bible, it's actually the very center of your Bible. <laughs> and God wants you to have it as the central message of your life. If you are in need of healing or want to minister healing, I highly recommend that you spend time talking with God, meditating on Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 5 is actually the core reality of your salvation, your healing for your spirit, soul, and body. Now, we know that we are a triune being, and we know that our spirit, soul, and body is so interconnected. I mean, like, you, can, you know that if somebody, their soul, their mind, and their emotions are off kilter, and they're under stress and fear and anxiety, they're going to experience bodily illness. And a lot of the fear, stress, and anxiety come because their spirit man is not trusting and having dominion over their soul and their body. They're in unbelief and doubt of who God is and what he has done on the cross. And that's a journey for all of us to take. They say 95% of all illnesses come from stress, fear, anxiety, and the like. So we're, it's all interconnected. But I want to take Isaiah 53, 5 so you can clearly see that healing is provided for sicknesses and diseases in the atoning work, the redemptive work of what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary for us. So Isaiah 53, 5 begins like this. But he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. That's the healing or salvation of the spirit. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. That's the healing for the soul. And by his stripes, we are healed. That's the healing for the body. The verse Isaiah 53, 4, right before this, says this, surely he has borne our griefs and our sorrows. Most all of the translations will say griefs and sorrows, but when you look up the Hebrew word that is actually there in place of grief and sorrows, for grief you'll actually see the Hebrew word coli, which actually means sicknesses and diseases, and where it says sorrows, the Hebrew word is makob, which actually means pain. So when you read this, accurately according to Hebrew, and some of the translations have this. It says, surely he has borne our sicknesses, diseases, and pain. Where? He bore them on the cross. I mean, that's fantastic. The Holy Spirit didn't want us to miss this point, that Jesus bore our sicknesses and diseases. In Matthew 8, 17 through 18, it says this. He himself, well, I want to back up, um, he healed all that were sick. Jesus, when he walked on earth, healed all that were sick. That he might fulfill this prophetic word from Isaiah 53, 5. It says this, that he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The word born and carried actually means complete removal of the thing born or carried. It denotes actual substitution. It's not done in fellowship with us. A lot of people go, yeah, Jesus is with me and they're sick and infirmed. No. It says he himself, Jesus himself, he didn't do it in fellowship with you. He himself bore our sicknesses and diseases. Why? so that you could receive the blessing of healing that he is offering. Surely he has borne it. He wants you to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that he has borne what you might be bearing right now in your body. If you take a look at the chart, 
Um, you can see the word bore or born in its relationship to both sin and sickness in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word born is seen in its relationship to sin, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. He bore their iniquities or sin. In his relationship to sickness, he has borne our sicknesses, Isaiah 53, 5. And then we see this in the New Testament, its relationship, born and born, to sin and sickness. In um, 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own, bore our own sin, his own body on the tree. That's her sin. And then in relationship to sickness, he himself took our infirmities and bore your sicknesses. And I just say all that because we really need to get this of what he actually did, that he took both. He bore sin he bore sickness. He himself bore sin. He himself bore sicknesses. There's a declaration. I changed it up if you want to say this after me. Um, Surely, Jesus bore my sickness, disease, and pain as my substitute, removing them from me just as he did my sin. How did Jesus remove your sin? as far as the east is from the west, remembering them no more. How far has he removed your sickness? I believe from the east to the west, remembering them no more. And that's what the mindset you get to have. Okay, Jesus is both your sin and your sickness substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When we accept the truth that Jesus bore our sins, then we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are truly the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sickness, became sick for you. It says this in Isaiah 53, 5. Or actually, Isaiah 53, 4. He was made sick for you. That's Young Living Translation. And that's a very accurate translation. He was made sick for you. Why? So that you wouldn't need to be or bear sicknesses here on this earth. So Jesus bore your sin and he bore your sickness and disease. So you could wear the garment of salvation, the garment of healing, as well as the robe of righteousness. Why was Jesus made sick? So that you could be healed. By his stripes you are healed. Okay? Do you have you ever heard that he was made sick with your sicknesses? (laughs) Okay, one person, couple people, good. He did that. Because he wants you to walk in the reality that you are the healed one. Jesus, who knew no no curse, was made a curse for you. Sickness and disease came as a curse. It shows that in Deuteronomy 28. Every sickness, every plague, and even the ones that were not are writ, we are told that we are delivered from those curses of sicknesses and diseases, the ones that don't show up in Deuteronomy 28. And if you want to know, like, hey, what am I redeemed from? What sickness and disease I'm redeemed from? Take a long read of that. And it has so many of the sicknesses and diseases lifted, uh, listed. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He was made a curse for us. He became the serpent. The serpent that was biting people with his poison, and then the poison spewed out of their mouth, complaining against God and Moses. Jesus took the poison in his own body, dying our death, so that we could have his life. The serpent, his power, the power of sin, the power of sickness was rendered powerless at the cross. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? So that we could receive all of the blessing, all of our salvation in Christ Jesus. 
When you receive by faith what Jesus did on the cross as your substitute, you will be set free from the curse of the law of sin and death. And that death curse included sickness and disease. Forgiveness and healing appear in the same passages of Scripture. This is number D on your sheet. And so you'll see, wow, here's forgiveness and here is healing in the same Bible verse. And when I saw Psalm 103 for the first time where it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, all his salvation benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit of destruction. When I saw that, oh, wow, there it is. He, he redeemed us from every sin, and he redeemed us from every sickness and disease. And you go, but, but I'm not experiencing that. I understand, and a lot of time it's a fight. So you put the word of God in your mouth, the truth, the sword of the spirit, and then by his stripes I was healed. You focus, you take your focus, and you look at what Jesus did on the cross rather than looking at your symptoms or the doctor's report. And that's a hard thing to do when we're called to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. But I believe as the body of Christ comes together and starts talking about this truth, this reality, this core reality of what Jesus did on the cross, and we are acting accordingly, we will see more of it. So people go, oh yeah, I went to Mozambique, Africa, Heidi Baker's ministry where they're raising the dead, but you know they teach that as normal Christianity. When's the last time you've heard a message on the, from the pulpit on healing, raising the dead? I wasn't hearing it, even though I was in a spirit-filled church. So when I needed healing, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> That's why we have the healing rooms. And I'm not exalting us above anybody else. It's just, I want this truth no longer concealed, like that dream my girlfriend had. And that's what the Lord was sharing with me that first week of April and ever since then, up until this message. <sighs> he was saying, Sue... I do not want the truth of what I have done on the cross concealed from my people any longer. Will you trump the message? Will you trump the message? Will you preach the kingdom of God is at hand? Will you join me in healing the sick and cleansing the leper and raising the dead and casting out demons even though you don't understand how this is possible, and even though you've only seen a little bit, are you willing to walk by the Spirit with me in this present reality of the kingdom of heaven and bringing God's kingdom here on this earth so his people won't live in hell on this earth and we can rise up as a mighty army of God and the truth be known? This is what each one of you all of us are being called into. For when Jesus comes, the second coming of Jesus Christ, he is raising up in a mighty army that believes in the full gospel of Jesus Christ. The full salvation of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. When we bless the Lord and not forget his benefit, what are we doing? We're coming in thankful agreement with what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, praising him and thanking him. And as you praise and thank him, you enter in to this reality. The enemy hates praising and thanking God. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that I am the healed one, that you are Jehovah Rapha, that you, the truth, prevails in my life, that you have dominion over me, these people. Walking in that reality, praising and thanking him, blessing his name. This is key to receiving the fullness of your salvation, the fullness of your healing. There's other scriptures there where you see forgiveness and healing put together, and you can read those in your handout. Um, and if you're online and need the handout, just go to Camarillo Healing Rooms and go to um, the, the resources and then teaching. Okay, I want to go to point number E, the present tense reality for your healing and end on this. The Old Testament looked forward to the cross 
Therefore, healing was put in the future tense. We see this in Exodus 23, 5, Deuteronomy 7, 15. I will take away your sickness and disease. Don't live as a new covenant believer in the future tense reality of I will. You're in the new covenant. Isaiah 53 Isaiah was looking at what Jesus would one day be doing on the cross, and he puts this reality in present tense. By his stripes, you are healed. And then in the new covenant, after Jesus already went to the cross, 1 Peter 2.24 puts this reality in past tense. By his stripes, you were healed. So you're going like, I can't wrap my mind around by your stripes I was healed because I have this pain here and this is happening here. And the Lord says, I've called you to walk by the spirit of truth of what I have done. Declare it, proclaim, proclaim it, thank me for it, praise me for it, thank me for it, and you will experience me. You will know me. You will experience heaven on earth. You live in the new covenant. Your healing was finished 2,000 years ago. Because of that, you don't need to put your healing into the future. You can put it into the past tense. Jesus bore the stripes for your healing. Jesus' stripes are your eternal evidence for healing. He will forever, ever. Wes just created a, a song on Revelation He's going to be forever remembered as the lamb who was slain for us. MRIs, x-rays, pain, all that is evidence of sickness and disease. But there's a greater evidence, a greater truth that God wants us to press into, to move away the palm tree branches, the excuses for not accepting this invitation he has given us in 1 Peter 2.24, that by his stripes you were healed. This is an invitation, a ticket he has given us. And in the ticket, your ticket to heaven includes your salvation. He paid, he took, he bore, he was made sick for your sicknesses so that you could come in and live in and live from the superior reality of his truth, of who he is, to eat of him by his stripes. You, past tense, were healed. All heaven knows that. <laughs> All heaven all the angels know this. Those who have gone before us know that, that are in heaven. He wants us to know that. F, God prefaces Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 with this question. Whose report will you believe? In the Garden of Eden, there was two invitations. One from God and one from Satan. Adam and Eve ate the invitation from Satan, calling the fall of mankind. You have an invitation. Whose report will you believe? <laughs> will you believe God's report that you were healed according to 1 Peter 2.24? Or will you believe Satan's report for your life that truly you are sick and infirmed and you'll never get well, never get better. Maybe you'll die from this or maybe you'll have to live with this forever. Those are Satan's lies. Your, your choice reflects who you believe God to be. When I understood this, it was like, oh, you mean when I make choices, it shows my belief if I believe God or Satan? Well, John 3.33 says this, he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. When you receive the testimony of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, you're certifying that God is the only true God. And Jesus is likewise the one in whom he sent. First John 5.10 says, He who has not believed God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. If you are pressing into this reality of believing Jesus, 
Scripture calls you. Yeah, Lord, I do believe that by his stripes I was healed. And I ask that you get me greater revelation, strengthen me in this faith. The power of choice is one of the greatest powers you and I have been given. God says this in Deuteronomy 30, 19. I have set before you life, the life in God, the life in Jesus Christ, and I have set before you death. He says, therefore, choose life, the life, the living word of God. Choose the life of Jesus Christ. He says, choose life. Choose my blessings so that you and your descendants will live. Choose the word of life. I know it's hard at times. Choose Jesus, the word of life. Choose 1 Peter 2.24, despite what everything else is saying, that by his stripes you were healed. And then there's a song that I heard a long time ago that really helped me and still helps me. And it's by um, Becky Fender. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. His report says I am healed. His report says I am filled. His report says I am free. His report says victory. So... Thank you for joining us online and in person. And I want to pray before we end. Father, I thank you and I praise you that you have revealed your son Jesus Christ to us. We thank you that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law of sin and death. He has redeemed us from the curse of sickness and disease And Father, I thank you right now for breaking people out of the bondage and captivity to sickness and disease. Father, I send forth your word right now and declare over people in this room and online that by the stripes that Jesus Christ bore for us, that we were healed. Father, I thank you. I thank you for totally freeing people right now. I thank you that your angelic host, Lord, is sent on assignment to do your word. I thank you that you have redeemed us from the curse of sickness and disease. I thank you, Jesus, that you yourself bore on the cross in our stead every sickness and every disease. I thank you strengthen us by the power of your spirit in the inner man to walk in this reality, to live in this reality, to live in the truth. And I thank you, Lord God, that our salvation in Christ Jesus includes healing and every other need that we are needing to be met. We thank you, we praise you, Lord God, for this message now going forth with power. We thank you that the gospel is the power of God for our salvation, for our healing. Strengthen us to put it in our heart and our mouth that we are asking for supernatural, Lord, strength right now. And I thank you, Lord God, for healing.